Welcome, everybody. Uh, so I'm looking around. I, I, I see not that many very young people. Uh, so this talk should actually be of great interest to us. So I want to see a, a, a show of hands. How many of you would like to reach 120? Honestly, how many of you? you know, it's about a third, maybe, if that, a quarter. OK, so let me change the question. How many of you would like to reach 120 if you could still feel the way you do today? Exactly. All right, so today I'm what, I'm get, what I'm going to tell you about uh, is technology, partly from my lab, but partly from labs around the world, that have really made a breakthrough in understanding why we age and how to control this process. And it's just reached the point now where it's commercializable, which means, more importantly, that there should be medicines coming online. And there, it may even be med medicines already prescribable to people today that can slow down aging. The important point here is that I'm not telling you that we're all going to live forever, but I, what I can tell you today is that we have the know-how now to make people live longer and, importantly, healthier lives. Okay? That's really important because there's no point extending lifespan if we're not going to be healthier because over the 20th century, mostly what we did was knock one disease on the head at a time. Uh, we call this whack-a-mole medicine. And what that's done is it's made us live longer but not better. And what we've got is a great burden of healthcare across the planet, not just in uh, what we call the developed world, but the developing world. Most of the world is, is aging rapidly. And this is actually one of the biggest challenges on the planet. It's as big a problem for the economy, world economy, as global warming. And what I hope to make the case today is that not only will this help individuals and the economy, but this is also going to help the planet because saving trillions eventually tens of trillions of dollars in healthcare costs at the end of life by compressing it down into a very short period, let's say a month of illness, will free up money across the planet that can be used to save species and protect the planet the way I think we would all agree is important. So we all have family members we love. Um, these are some family members uh, of that I'm very close to. I'm genetic related, genetically related to this line of people. On the left is my grandmother, Vera, who uh, insisted I call her Vera. She stayed very young at heart up until the very end. Uh, she escaped Hungary in 1956 and lived a, a standard 20th century life. She, into her 60s and 70s, she was vivacious. She was kicked off Bondi Beach for wearing a bikini in the 50s. Um, but towards the end of her life, the last 10 years were really hard to watch as a, as a young boy. Um, and this is not something you would wish on anybody, not even your enemies. And really towards the end, she'd given up. She said, um, this is just the way life goes. Uh, but I, I refuse to accept that aging is just something we have to live with. Because 100 years ago, we used to say the same thing about cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's. And if you're wondering, why don't we just focus on cancer, heart disease and Alzheimer's, that's great. My mother died of lung cancer. I'm the first person to say cancer is a worthwhile cause. But if we stopped cancer today, the average lifespan on the planet would increase no more than two and a bit years. Because all causes, uh, because aging is going up all the time and all diseases are increasing exponentially. So even if you stop one, you'll die shortly after from something else. So we need to address diseases at their core. In fact, my mother died from, uh, of lung cancer ostensibly because she was a smoker and her risk went up with smoking fivefold. That's terrible, fivefold, of course, that's going to uh, potentially lead to death. But from age 20 to 70, your chance of getting cancer goes up a thousandfold. But we don't address aging. In fact, most people don't even realize it's something worthwhile doing. So I hope today I can change that. So my father is, my grandmother, as you can see, died uh, in 2015, and I was a, a, a fairly typical uh, and long lasting, painful, drawn-out process. My father is still alive. Uh, he was born, uh, as you can see, in 1939, and he's just turning 80. And as you'll see, uh, he's leading a very different life, as different as I think the future generations will lead um, going forward. So the question is, why do we age? And I, th I think a lot of people don't even ask that question. It's just something we live with. We see it every day. Everything dies. Why do we need to understand aging? Well, we can't address aging, we can't slow it down, we can't prevent diseases until we truly understand what's going on. So one of the breakthroughs that's come through in the last 20 years, 
in aging research is to understand that the body has inbuilt defenses, pathways that you can activate by being a little bit hungry. I skip a meal whenever I can. Uh, it's hard, but I try. You can exercise. They turn on these anti-aging pathways. And eventually we'll have medicines that can do the same. But we need to understand at the fundamental uh, level, why do we age? just as much as the, the Wright brothers needed to understand aerodynamics and why it is that birds can stay in the air. And I think that we've had a breakthrough in the field in understanding at the fundamental level why we age. Now, if you go to the literature right now, you'll see that we people who study aging generally agree that there are about eight or nine causes of aging. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere loss, epigenetic changes. Uh, but we're still trying to address each cause separately like building nine dams on nine tributaries. But is there a unifying cause of aging? I think there might be, and let me tell you about that. At the root cause of aging, I think, lies a loss of information in the body. We live in the information age, and it's right in front of us. So a little bit about information before I get into biology. So I'm inspired by this guy here. Uh, this is Claude Shannon. In the 1940s, uh, he was publishing on how to communicate information across long distances and in space, uh, in time as well, without losing that information. And he knew this to be very important because he'd seen in World War II what happens if signals don't make it. And so he developed a mathematical uh, theory of communication, uh, and it really transformed the world. In this diagram, what you can see is that there is a transmitter of information and a receiver and in between those two points is noise. Now, there are two types of information. There's analog and digital. We've transformed our world recently by going to digital, which is very, uh, a very accurate way and a relatively lossless way of transmitting information. The other thing that was a breakthrough in this paper was he said, well, if the, if the information doesn't make it to the end intact, maybe what we should do is have an observer that holds the original information just in case we lose it along the way and then we go back and retrieve it. And that was a key breakthrough that led, in fact, to today's internet. We have the TCP IP protocol that allows us, if our email doesn't make it or a photo doesn't make it, we go back and get the rest of those bits and bytes. So that's transformed our world electronically. But I think also if we apply this theory to biology, we have a chance of not just slowing aging, but actually reversing it. Because I think that our bodies may actually have an observer that holds the information to be young again. So how is information stored in our bodies? Well, actually, there are two types of information. There's the genetic information, of course, in DNA. There are four bases of DNA. Uh, so it's a base four uh, digital format. And as I mentioned, digital format is very good for copying, it's long-lasting, it, you can even get DNA out of mummies and read it. And we don't think anymore that the loss of the DNA code is necessarily the key driver of aging. It plays some part, but what I would like to argue today, and give you some evidence that it's true, is that it's the other form of information in the body that we lose over time that's even more important for driving aging. And that's the epigenetic information in the cell that's laid down beautifully during embryogenesis, and development, uh, but aging starts in the womb, in fact, and we can now measure the clock of aging in part by measuring the methylation, chemical uh, additions to the DNA that accumulate over time. And uh, you probably know what I, uh, what's on this screen. The blue is the DNA, and those green are representative of histone proteins that package the DNA and tell the cell how to read the right gene at the right time and then a nerve cell will stay a nerve cell for your life, and a liver cell will stay a liver cell, hopefully, for most of your life. The other thing that, that I want to mention here is we work on proteins in my lab that control which genes are on and off. Epigenetic factors, we call these genes the sirtuins, and they make enzymes that are very important, and they require a molecule called NAD. And anybody who remembers their high school biology will remember that NAD is a molecule that's required for life, and without it, we're dead in 30 seconds. Problem is, as we get older, we think that we have less and less NAD. So by the time you're my age, which is 50, you have potentially even half of what we had, I had when I was 20. So sirtuins seem to control the epigenetic information. Now, it's important to know that epigenetic information is not digital. 
it cannot be. It has to respond quickly to the environment, what we eat, how we're, uh, if we're running, if we're breathing enough. That means it needs to be in analog format. And anyone who's had a cassette tape or even a record knows that analog information can be lost over time. It's very hard to copy. It's very hard to shield from cosmic rays. Eventually, it's lost. I think that's what's going on with aging as well. So if we translate that to biology, what it means is that the cell, this is an example on the screen of a nucleus, and those lines are the DNA, and those blobs are these chromatin factors, such as the sirtuins, that control which genes are on and which ones are off. And those patterns determine cellular identity. What we think is happening is there's, there's noise going on all the time, so that cells eventually turn the wrong genes on, so that your nerve cells start to feel like they're more like skin cells, and we found that kidney cells start to resemble more like, more, um, like, act more like muscle cells in the old mouse that we study. One of the things we've figured out is what actually can drive that process. What is the noise in the cell? Uh, so by analogy, uh, I often describe this as a compact disc system. And so for the, the really young people in the audience, a compact disc is something we used to put information on. We used to store songs on it. It was really crazy. We could, we could, we could fit an entire movie on there. It was awesome. Uh, anyway, so the, what's important about this analogy is that the information on a scratch compact disc is retrievable. In the same way, I think that an old cell's information is still retrievable. It's just that in an old cell or in a scratch compact disc, it's, it's hard to read the right songs at the right time. But imagine if you could polish this CD and get the information back. So we've been testing this. There are two predictions of this hypothesis. Uh, one is if you scratch the CD or introduce epigenetic noise, cause cells to lose their identity, will you get aging? And then the second prediction is if I can cause aging, can I take it away? So I'll tell you some results that we've had in the lab that we're just writing up for publication now. Here's what happens if you scratch that DVD or the CD. You can see that these mice in my lab um, look very different. And you, I, you may want to ask yourself, which mouse is older? It turns out they're genetically identical and were born the same day. But the one on the right has had its epigenome tweaked in a way that accelerates what we think is the aging process. Now, you might be wondering, how does this happen? Well, we've actually shown that uh, cutting the DNA leads to uh, an, a disruption of the epigenome. And as I mentioned, if you can cause what looks like aging, you can take it away, potentially. So how do you find the original information to restore cellular identity? And the trick was uh, actually, to, to follow in the footsteps of this man on the right, which is, uh, he is Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering genes that convert adult cells into stem cells. So you can reverse aging in the dish, but can you reverse it in an animal? And so we tested that in the lab. We packaged three of the genes that Yamanaka discovered, um, standing for uh, OSK, KLF4, uh, and SOX2. These three genes, OSK, we package into a virus. There's a virus here. And we can introduce that into an animal and ask, does it protect the organism? Does it make the organism feel young again? And in this experiment I'm going to show you, what we're doing is testing something that normally doesn't happen in an adult animal, but only happens in a very, very young animal. And that's the regrowth of optic nerves. We all know if we have a spinal injury, as, as we've heard earlier uh, from Greg, and in this experiment what we do is we pinch the back of the eye and the optic nerve dies back. As you can see in the, the figure here, that, that red area is where the living nerves are, heading away from the eye, but then all of the nerves have died back towards the brain. So you can see this dead area on the left. But if we turn on these reprogramming epigenetic factors, these Yamanaka factors, after the, the break, after the squeezing with tweezers, what we get is something that would only normally happen in embryos the regrowth of nerves, and these nerves actually, if you leave them long enough, will grow all the way back to the brain. Now, we can also reprogram old mice. We've taken uh, one-year-old mice, two-year-old mice, introduced the virus into those, turned it on, and within four weeks, those mice can see just as well as when they were young, compared to young mice. So that's an interesting thing. A retina can actually be restored in terms of its function, not just slow down aging. So finally, I just want to show you something else. I mentioned NAD is important for controlling these genes that regulate the epigenome. And one of these, I don't know if you can trigger that movie to play, 
But this is a, a treadmill experiment uh, looking at mice that have been on an NAD booster molecule. And NAD boosters will stabilize the epigenome and make cells younger. And these mice, uh, if you could see them running, the one on the left has been on this molecule just for four weeks, and its muscles are acting as though it's young and can run actually up to twice as far as the control. And we published this uh, in a journal just last year. So NAD boosters mimic exercise, as we had expected. And there are clinical trials now ongoing with these and more advanced molecules. So the future looks really interesting. We're close to having molecules, hopefully we'll, we'll see safety and efficacy in these clinical trials. But what does the future look like? Let me just paint that for you. So what if we could truly reprogram, pro, reprogram our bodies? You could imagine, um, not just Bill Murray, but all of us could one day be genetically uh, reprogrammed, or at least infected with a virus that could turn on these resetting genes. And in mice, we know that that restores the epigenetic clock. You can take the animals back a seemingly um, a large percentage of their lifespan. So what if, in the future, if it's safe, we all have this w waiting in our bodies? And if we get injured, we have a spinal injury, we just get diabetes, we get uh, dementia, we take a course of an antibiotic which we actually have shown works to induce these genes in, in the animal. And perhaps that would lead to rejuvenation, and you go back a decade or two, and then it, you age for 20 years, and then you go back to your doctor and get another course of antibiotics. And I don't know how many times you can repeat that, but we'll see. So just to finish, I want to give us a glimmer of hope here, because we all know what's coming. No one, else, no one gets out of this life alive, unfortunately. But my father, you remember from the first slide, he was born at a time when he's just on the cusp of potentially being able to benefit from these technologies. And he's been taking uh, a couple of molecules that we've been publishing on, resveratrol and, and NMN, this NAD booster. Now, I don't know if they're working. He doesn't know if they're working. But what's heartwarming, if nothing else, is that he's now 80. He started a second career. This is just an example of six months of his, his recent life. And he's just he's wondering, what's going to happen now that I don't seem to be getting old and I'm, I'm watching all, he's watching all his friends uh, decline at that age. So hopefully uh, he'll continue on. I certainly hope so. I hope that he gets to spend time with his great-great-grandkids uh, and impart the wisdom that the older people just haven't had a chance to do until, uh, until recently and hopefully even more so as these technologies come on board. And so what am I telling you? I'm telling you that these, there are technologies that are just around the corner that could really change the world, not just for, for families, but for the economy of the world, freeing up trillions of dollars that could actually allow us to, to make this much, uh, world a much better place where we could all thrive, be more productive, and impart the wisdom that I think is a great loss every time someone passes away. Anyway, thank you for listening. I appreciate it.